The grade 2 unsolved problem comes to us from I Say Sure, who proposed it in 1916. Whenever I present it to the class, I suggest that there are two bubbling cauldrons, and I ask the first child, where would you like to put the first frog? Into this bubbling cauldron or this one? And the child might say, I'll put it into the orange one. And then the next child might say the blue one, and so on. And then I hit a child and I say, and where would you like to put frog number seven? And the child says, oh, I'll put it in the orange pot. And I say, you've been gooped because three plus four is equal to seven. And the child thinks for a little bit and he says, but if I put it in the blue pot, then two plus five is equal to seven. And I'd say, yes, you've been set up. You're going to be gooped no matter what you do. Being gooped is an excuse to give a child a failure. Now, this is failure in a fun context. I do not explain the rules of this puzzle before I present it. It's much too uh, um, sanitized to go and present, oh, these are the rules, and this is what... No, it's much more interesting for the children to present an emotional response to have a failure and to have um, a little hint of violence by dropping these frogs into these bubbling cauldrons. Uh, this is... Uh, from, from from years of presenting this problem. This has easily been solved for, for two pots, and the answer, I'll let you figure out what the answer is. Well, it's eight. Okay. Uh, for three pots, uh, if a child or a pair of children figure out the solution, I don't say, oh, class, these people have solved it faster than all of you. No, I just gently go to them and I say, uh, now I try it for three pots. I wonder how high you can get there. Do you think you get to 15 or 16? And the actual solution, the actual highest number, which I don't expect any grade 2 student to get to, is 23. The answer has been figured out for four pots, but not for five and higher. If you want to see some students tackling this problem, then click in the center of your screen. Frobenius's coin problem from the 1880s is probably best known now as the Chicken McNugget problem. In that problem, you have the option of buying six, nine, or 20 Chicken McNuggets. What is the largest number of Chicken McNuggets that you cannot buy? Well, you could buy 40 by just buying two 20s. You could buy 49 by buying two 20s and a nine. What's the largest number that you can't buy? I'll give you a hint, it's under 50. One of the most engaging problems in the grade two classroom is Klingon attack. Start by attacking at the engines and working your way up. I'm going to start with a 5 seconds and 3 seconds. 5 plus 3, that's 8. And I'll put a 1 over there. That's 3 plus 1, that's 4 seconds. I'll attack there. 8 plus 4 is 12 seconds. I'll attack there. And 6, 11, 19. At 31 seconds, I have destroyed this Klingon spaceship. That's pretty good. North America's been destroyed, but the rest of the world has been saved. Thank goodness. But can we do better? Well, let's see. What happens if I go like this? Well, that looks pretty good until you see that at three seconds, I don't know where to shoot. So unfortunately, and at seven seconds, I don't know where to shoot. So unfortunately, this spaceship gets through and the whole world is obliterated and we've lost. Do not tell your students the rules for this game. Just ask them to feed in numbers at the bottom and then at the top, you tell them you've succeeded or the world's been obliterated or whatever. And uh, that's kind of an emotional engagement rather than in a very sterile way describing the rules that you can't have duplicates. One student asks, am I allowed zeros? And my answer is, absolutely you're allowed zeros. Of course, if a student puts a zero in, there's automatically going to be a duplicate, but that's not part of the rules. Let's see if we can do better. So here we go. This is 24 seconds. That's, that's getting significantly better. No duplicates. Uh, you can get the students to create their own puzzles. So here we have three Klingon uh, spaceships exactly the same attacking. You cannot have a duplicate number anywhere. So uh, this is the best that I could do, 56 seconds. Ed Pegg at the conference wrote a quick little program to prove that this was not the best solution possible. 
there's actually quite a few solutions that are better than this one, and this one took me quite a little bit of time to find, so uh, good luck finding, <laughs> finding the other solutions. Here we have a bunch of termites that are connected, and we're, we're trying to uh, degrade their network, we take the we, we kill off some termites, so here we're going to kill off a whole bunch. And the termite score is equal to the number that are martyred. So here we've got four, five, six, seven, there we've got thirteen martyred, plus the biggest group remaining. What is the biggest group? All connected. Yeah, so that group there has got seven, so they score thirteen plus seven. So the termite score is twenty. And of course, we are trying to minimize that score. We don't want lots of martyrs. If we kill off all of these um, termites, uh, there's 30 of them, then this termite score would be 30. And if we just leave them as they are, well, then the biggest group is 30 big. So again, they're scoring 30. So we're trying to minimize that score, and 20 is pretty good, but you can get better. The best way to degrade these termite terrorist networks is entirely not obvious. The best solution that I found here is this one, and I got a score of 26. Students love to create these and to challenge each other to try to get as low a score as possible. Lots of other problems were considered, including magic squares and combinatorial walking. This problem from 1937 is especially deserving. It's the postage stamp problem. Here we want to send an envelope using only two stamps. What can, what, what can we send? Can we send a one cent envelope? Yes, just use the one cent stamp. A two cents? Yes. Three cents? Yes. Four cents? Yeah, you could put a one and a three on there. Uh, five? Yes. Six? We can get up to eleven cents. Twelve cents we can do with two sixes. Two six cent stamps. Can we do thirteen? We're running into problems. So for the first time, we fail at 13 cents. If you're the government of this country and you want to make sure that citizens can, can uh, send envelopes from 1 to 13 cents, how could you do those stamps differently? How could you produce those stamps differently? And what's the highest number that you could get? Could you go from 1 to 20 cents by choosing very carefully which stamps you're producing? An interesting problem. Lastly, here are two unsolved sorting problems that were considered but discarded. They're beautiful. The first one is this problem here. We're going to be sorting origami creatures from most cuddly, the bunny rabbit, down to least cuddly, the scorpion. This, should, this algorithm should work no matter what our input is. So that, that's our desired output on the right there. So this is our algorithm, this is kind of like a computer program, and what shall we use as our input? Well, we can choose anything we want, it should always work. Let's see if this algorithm is successful. So we're inputting the turtle, then the scorpion, then the cat, then the hedgehog, then the bunny. The first question that we ask is, is the turtle or the scorpion more cuddly? If the turtle is uh, more cuddly, then we just keep them there. If the scorpion is more cuddly, then we're going to flip the positions. In this case, the scorpion is less cuddly, the turtle is more cuddly, they're in the right order, so we leave it as is and we go on to the second question. The second question, is the cat or the turtle more cuddly? Well, in this case, we do need to swap because the cat is more cuddly than the turtle, so we're going to swap. There we go. The third question, the fourth question, the fifth question, the sixth question, the seventh question, the eighth question, and the ninth question. Have we ended up with the right order? No, unfortunately we haven't. Look at this, we have the bunny rabbit in the correct position, the, the cat in the correct position, but then we've got the hedgehog and the turtle swapped and the scorpion is in the right position. So this algorithm did not work. And your first job to tackle as a class is to try to find a computer algorithm with nine questions that actually will always solve, no matter what input, will always manage to sort them out and get them in the right order. 
The second sorting problem is by Bill Gates. He wrote a paper on this in 1979. The objective here is to sort these pancakes from the biggest pancake, which we want to have on the bottom, to the smallest pancake, which we want to have on the top. Each time you can flip. So here, there's my spatula and I'm going to flip it over. There we go. And I'm going to do that again just for here. Just flip that. And then I'm going to flip the whole stack over. So with just three flips, I have ordered these pancakes from uh, the biggest to the least big. Uh, very tough problem to do generally. I will give you these two. Both of them can be done in seven flips and good luck.